Hello and welcome to this special event, a panel discussion on Catholic teaching and the COVID-19 vaccine. As you will have seen, the aim of this dialogue is to bring together a Catholic doctor, a Catholic lawyer and a Catholic bishop to discuss and provide the faithful with information on the COVID-19 vaccine and what the Catholic Church teaches about vaccines and particularly the common good. Our panelists are Dr. Ruella Clipstrom, Graham Connolly, Gray Connolly, and Bishop Richard Umbers, and I'm your host, Queen Guevara, currently the manager of Catholic Youth Parramatta, and I'm really honoured to be sharing this space with our guests today. My role for this uh, for this event is really to facilitate the discussions, uh, drawing from the questions that have been submitted over the last week from the public. Before I dive into uh, the questions with our panelists, I'd like to make a quick disclaimer. All of the information that is provided here is for the general public and is general information. And therefore, it is not intended to be substituted for professional, medical or legal advice. This information should not be relied upon as legal or medical advice. And you should definitely consult your doctor or health professional or legal professional for specific advice. The answers, the questions and matters discussed here do not necessarily reflect the views, opinions or positions of the Diocese of Parramatta. And we have this respectful discussion about this matter uh, and it is welcome and important because, of course, this topic is on the minds of many, many people right across not only our diocese, but I'd say across the whole world. So very happy to be here. I'd like to first begin with a prayer, just inviting the Holy Spirit to be present with us as we enter into this dialogue. And so we just place ourselves and remind ourselves that we're in the presence of God in this moment. In the name of the Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Amen. Come, Holy Spirit, fill the hearts of your faithful and kindle in them the fire of your love. Send forth your spirit and they shall be created and you shall renew the face of the earth. O God, who by the light of the Holy Spirit did instruct the hearts of the faithful, grant that by the same Holy Spirit we may be truly wise and ever enjoy his consolations through Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. In the name of the Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Amen. So it is my pleasure to introduce you to our panelists. I will read a brief bio of each of them and uh, allow them to say a brief welcome to you all listening to us today. Our first panelist is Dr. Rowella Clipsham. Dr. Rowella Clipsham. Clipsham is an emergency physician currently employed by a public hospital in South Sydney. With over 10 years of experience as a doctor, she also has an interest in public health, having completed postgraduate studies in epidemiology and statistics. Dr. Clipsham can provide insight from life on the front lines of the pandemic, as well as its broader impact on our health system. Welcome, Dr. Rowella. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here. Thank you for the invite. Looking forward to your insights. Our next panelist is Gray Connolly. Gray Connolly is a barrister at the Sir Edmund Barden Chambers in Sydney. He has advised and represented many corporate and individual clients in commercial and public law matters, including the state of New South Wales and the Australian government, and has advised on national security matters. Gray lectures in Australian constitutional law. He has honours, he's an honours graduate at, uh, at the University of Sydney and the University of New South Wales in arts and law. Gray is a frequent panelist for the ABC radio and television, and he has been published in various newspapers and journals. He's married and has had, uh, has had a dog named Churchill and is a lifelong supporter of South Sydney Rabbitohs and the Richmond Football Club. He still plays football and soccer as a midfielder. Welcome, Gray. Thank you. Great to be here. Thank you for having me. Finally, our last panellist is Bishop Richard Umbers. Bishop Umbers is the Auxiliary Bishop of the Archdiocese of Sydney. He holds a Bachelor of Economics and a Master's of Management. Studied at the University of Navarra in Spain, where he received a doctorate in philosophy. On the 1st of September 2002, a, he was ordained a priest at the spectacular 11th century Marian Shrine at Teresa Huedad, in northern Spain. He tutored and lectured in philosophy at the University of Notre Dame, Sydney between 2006 and 2013, 
and served as spiritual advisor to the University St. Thomas More Society. As part of his engagement with students, Bishop Richard attended World Youth Day in Sydney in 2008 and in Krakow, Poland in 2016. And on the 25th of June, 2016, Pope Francis appointed Bishop Richard as Auxiliary Bishop of Sydney. He is widely published in philosophy, regularly addresses youth gatherings, and has a strong interest in social media, and has a library of his own podcast. Welcome, Bishop Umbers. Thank you. And uh, there's be one more podcast to that. I was, I was wondering before whether or not we couldn't just do this, wrap it up in a couple of TikToks, but <laughs> you know, a more extended conversation. That might be possible at the end of all the questions and answers. We'll see how we go. All right, so to kick us off, we do have a number of general questions that we'll be posing to the panelists. And then after that, more directed questions that have been submitted through, uh, through to our comms team. I'll first begin with the subject of education. And before I do, I'd like to preface with a statement that's been provided by the Catholic Schools of New South Wales. Catholic Schools New South Wales takes a leadership role in coordinating and representing Catholic education New South Wales at a state and national level. Catholic Schools New South Wales is committed to representing the interests of Catholic schools across New South Wales and acknowledges concerns regarding mandated vaccinations. We are yet to receive a copy of the draft public health order mandating vaccinations for all school staff. However, we are engaging with the government and advocating for the needs of exemptions similar to exemptions which exists for enforced by the public health orders. So with that preface, we'd like to start off with our first question that we have here. And I invite any of you to respond accordingly. So first question comes to us and says, what is the church's stance on mandatory vaccinations for teachers in New South, New South Wales, taking into consideration that people who are vaccinated can still contract and transmit COVID? Um. I'll, look, I'll go first on the on the legal side. Um, this is largely a a grey area, if I can use that phrase. Um, there is yet to be anything um, from government, federal or state, in relation to employers mandating vaccinations. As a general rule, as a general rule, um, there is implied into every employment contract the idea that an employee uh, should follow the lawful and reasonable directions of their employer. So that is there. And in certain places, a vaccination uh, regime that is mandatory or where everyone is involved in it, um, absent some obvious uh, lawful or reasonable excuse, which can hopefully be accommodated, um, that, sort of, that sort of regime will, will be found to be reasonable, like a mandatory ra uh, vaccination regime will be found to be reasonable in certain areas, depending on the facts and the circumstances. So for instance, in New South Wales particularly, um, there is going to be um, there is going to be say mandates for healthcare workers, aged care residents, and the like, where obviously uh, people who work say in airports, air transport, and the like, where that is uh, reasonable. It's reasonable because there are situations in there where people are obviously dealing with um, uh, the vulnerable. In the case of aged care and healthcare, you're dealing with the vulnerable, and you obviously don't want to have people being uh, put at more risk by their aged care worker or their transport worker and the like. Um, and so, so that, that regime of, of mandatory um, vaccinations, that, that, that issue is going to arise. And it will really be, on a, I think, on a case-by-case -case basis or on an industry-by-industry -industry basis. Um, I think it will be I, – I, I think it's going to be very hard to use terms like mandatory because it sounds like it just has a – idea that everyone is going to be lined up and forced to get the jab or will be terminated. And I just don't think it's going to be like that. I think there'll be very, very uh, strong incentives for people to be vaccinated in a variety of areas. There'll be strong encouragements. I'm, I, I'm not yet sure that's going to lead to the people who do not get vaccinated, say, to be terminated. Uh, there are certain protections in Australian law for workers um, against unjust dismissal and the like. There will have to be a process that employer and employee goes through um, to deal with a vaccination regime. It could be that employers ask employees who refuse to get vaccinated to explain why they're not getting vaccinated, what is the basis of their objection. Um, and it's really going to be a, a question of, is that objection in any way sustainable and can it be reasonably accommodated by an employer? Um, there is there's just a general, 
I mean, there was a very recent fair work decision uh, in in this year in relation to an employee who refused to get, who worked in an aged care home, who refused to get the flu vaccine. And um, she, and this is because when she was younger, she had had a very, very uh, bad reaction to a flu vaccine that she'd had as a child. And she did not want to get it when it was older. And for much, much of the time she was employed in aged care, she was an older woman, that wasn't a problem. But her employer made it, uh, I think from 2020, that everyone had to get the flu vaccine. And she refused to do so. And uh, Fair Work, the Fair Work Commission found uh, that her objection uh, could not override the responsibilities of her employer, which was an aged care facility, to provide a safe environment for you know, the clients and the workers of that aged care facility. And it could be very much that we're in for a series of cases where employees um, claimed rights or objections to getting vaccinated are simply overridden by the employer's duties to provide a safe workplace for their, their workers so, so that their workers can turn up, but also for the clients of their business. And so it's going to be very difficult. I think what will end up happening is the federal and state governments will have to come down with some very, very clear guidance on industry by industry and what's expected, because otherwise, uh, I think for employers, it's just going to be very, very hard. In relation to schools, again, you have that that same issue to some degree. Um, schools will have, uh, obviously, first of all, concern about the children, uh, but then you know, teachers and parents also protecting teachers from being um, uh, made vulnerable to 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 transmission of the illness. Um, uh, Teachers, like everyone else in society, span a wide variety of ages and backgrounds and susceptibilities. And so I don't think it will just be about the rights of people to object to being vaccinated. It will be about the rights of people who are vaccinated or people who who cannot be vaccinated but who are vulnerable to COVID. It will be about their rights to being protected from people who are, who are deliberately unvaccinated. So I think it's going to be very, very hard and there's going to be a battle of assertion of rights. But um, if I can give just a general statement, I think... I think, um, on the whole, the view will be it's lawful and reasonable for employers to require people to be vaccinated, and the onus will really be on people who do not want to be vaccinated to explain why, what's the basis of your objection, and then it will be up to employer and employee to try and negotiate some way for that unvaccinated person to stay employed in some capacity. It may be that there's no um, there's no real accommodation possible because it's just too difficult if people refuse to get vaccinated. That's just That's just right now, but this is all very much in that grey area I, I mentioned at the beginning. Does that help? Thanks, Gray. I no, appreciate I that. I also wanted to address that idea that vaccinated people can still transmit um, COVID. Um, so this is an evolving area in the literature, but having reviewed the literature, um, we do know that vaccinations um, are at least 60 to 80%, if not more, effective in reducing symptomatic infection. Um, and that means that if you don't get the illness, if you're protected against getting the illness, then you can't transmit it. Um, so, and while the effectiveness is slightly lower with Delta than it was for the, the previous strains of the virus, um, the effectiveness is still there. Um, we also know that even though the effectiveness against symptomatic infection is slightly lower, um, the effectiveness against um, death against hospitalisation and against ICU admissions is still as high as it ever was in the vicinity of 90%. So the idea that people can still transmit the illness is true because the vaccine is not 100% effective and no one has been claiming that it is. Mm. Your risk of transmitting it is much lower if you are vaccinated. Mm. Now, there has been a couple of more, um, a couple of other studies um, that have shown that even people who are vaccinated can still have um, significant amounts of, um, of COVID DNA material in their upper respiratory tracts. But what we have also seen from the evidence is that when you are vaccinated, you are less likely to transmit, um, even if that's the case. So there was a study in Israel that showed that um, that looked at the close contacts uh, of people who still caught COVID, who even though they were vaccinated, um, sorry, who still who caught COVID, um, and they looked at the people who had COVID who were vaccinated versus the people who weren't, and how likely they were 
to transmit it to their close contacts. Um, and people were uh, people who were vaccinated transmitted it to 20% of their close contacts. People who were unvaccinated, 40%. So um, you, you are twice as more likely to, to transmit COVID um, if you are unvaccinated compared to if you're vaccinated. I would say that the, the church recognises uh, the right to conscientious objection, not as uh, something frivolous or simply as a preference, but where there are reasons that though you disagree with them are defensible. Um, so that also means that, that we look to try to cater for uh, people. And, and it would, I mean, it is a gray area. And you would be looking very specifically at, well, there are communities within a community. Some very, very much require uh, a special sensitivity to, to, because we look as an act of love to, to defend the vulnerable. Um, and, and alongside that conscience objection, of, of course, is, is the responsibility upon all of us to uh, avoid putting other people uh, at risk. And, and so undertaking whatever steps are necessary to avoid that. Um, and and that, that can mean, you know, um, fairly, fairly onerous uh, steps at times, I, I think, you know, out of, out of concern for others. Um, our, own, our own individual good is tied up with, with the common good. Can I, can, I just, can I just add to something I said before? I mean, in New South Wales, for instance, there are already public health orders about mandatory, basically mandating vaccination for, say, uh, quarantine workers, um, transportation workers, airport workers. Um, there are also requirements already for workers from areas of concern. And so we're already starting to see the, the, the building of that. It's just that as of today's date, there's nothing finite. My, my only piece of advice to people is, first of all, get vaccinated. I, I think I've, I've been vaccinated. I can't stress enough how, how important I think it's been to get vaccinated. That's, that's just my opinion. Um, but um, if you're really, it's going to be up to you as a person refusing to be vaccinated to be able to show that there is some good faith, well-founded reason why you cannot be vaccinated. It's, it's, it's it's going to come down to that, and it's not it's not going to be enough, uh, particularly as vaccine rates, you know, vaccination rates rise. Um, it's going to be harder and harder to sustain some argument that, um, absent some sort of honest, good faith, conscientious objection, uh, there has to be some sort of this has to be something finite to the objection, um, and I just think it's it's not. I, I think at this stage anyway, it will be very hard for people who are not vaccinated, uh, working in certain areas, not all areas, but in certain areas, to sustain a, a reasonable excuse for not being vaccinated where being vaccinated is so essential to the, the work being done. And mm. for instance, you know, if, you're, if you're front facing to the public, you deal with people every day, uh, that's going to be different to say someone who works in a back office or, or you know, you know, versus someone like who works in reception or or in a front of house sort of role, that's yeah. going to be different. There's already mandates for say um, healthcare workers. Yeah. So when I go for a job, I need to submit my immunisation records to prove that I'm vaccinated against certain illnesses. And the idea is that it prevents me from getting illness, not um, not necessarily so much that it prevents um, me from transmitting it to other people. Um, and that's the whole, you know, that's, that's half of the idea with vaccinations. Sure. Mm, great. Thank you for that. We'll now move on to our second question. This one's a little longer, so please bear with me. Will teachers employed by Catholic schools be sacked if they choose not to have the trial medication intervention? Can you explain if their contract is cancelled for this reason? And how does this align with the Australian Catholic bishops frequently answered questions and guidance for the community in Australia regarding COVID-19 vaccines, which states that the Vatican's Congregation for the Doctrine of the Faith is clear that vaccination is not, as a rule, a moral obligation and must be voluntary. No one should be coerced to receive any vaccine. Can I just say, it's not a trial medication. Um, it's been fully approved. Um, it's 
gone through rigorous um, safety testing, phase one, phase two, phase three. And while it has been rapid and that it's been streamlined and fast tracked, no shortcuts have been taken. Um, and, and I'll talk probably a little bit later about the safety, um, you know, and the, and the potential risks with, um, with the vaccination, but it's definitely not a trial medication. Um, it's, it's been approved by the TGA. Um, and, and I think the evidence suggests that it's, you know, we're well past the trial stage. Great. Thank you. Rella, would I be would I be right in saying that the TGA has, if anything, been very slow compared to other regulators in approving our vaccines? Um, I don't more, ca more cautious. Yeah, look, I I can't say with certainty to be honest. Um, I know that every country has their own regulatory body that will look at the evidence. Um, so I can't really comment. I think we have had the benefit of having a really a relatively safe twenty twenty. Um, so our environment um, has not been as pressured as most other parts of the world. Um, so we've had the benefit of seeing how other countries' rollouts have been and um, the benefit of seeing their safety data and their vaccine surveillance data. Um, and, and we've been the benefits of, of that We've been the recipients of the benefits of that information. Can I, can I just pick up on, on the legal question? Are people going to be turned? I mean, basically, am I going to be fired if I don't get the jab? I think that's the undertake. I, I'm not. I, I can't speak for anyone who's in Catholic schools or or any other employer, by the way. Um, I'm just not sure as yet that's going to be the issue. I think the issue is going to be: can someone who refuses to be vaccinated can they be otherwise accommodated somewhere? I think that will probably be where that issue ends up. I. I think some of the um, the rhetoric about this, about um, vaccine passports or uh, yeah, people being terminated as va vaccine refuseniks, I think that's very unhelpful. I think it's unnecessarily polarising. I think um, we may end up when this finally becomes, uh, I don't use that phrase, rubber meets the road, but I think when we may come down to the fact that actually the uptake on vaccinations is very good, um, that we actually only have a small number of people really who refuse to get the vaccine and they can be accommodated in some way, in some areas. Teaching may be difficult though, and it may be a decision that's taken out of Catholic schools' hands because the government as a whole may mandate that everyone in education has to be vaccinated. And in which case there will be no doubt processes within that mandate or that, that direction uh, from government uh, that will allow for conscience protections and the like. Um, I think it's, very unlikely we're going to end up in the, the the most feared scenarios where people are literally being fired or terminated for not getting vaccinated. I think I think people need to just calm down a bit and think this through. Sure, thank you. I'm, I would say that from the point of view of the the the, the moral agent, um, intention matters a lot. So that if you are a researcher or a government official when it comes to particular of these vaccines, you have a, a special duty to, to look for uh, uh, something that is ethically not problematic um, as regards that association with the fetal tissues uh, cells from the 1970s. Uh, but when it gets down to downstream, to, to those of us who receive the vaccine, um, the material cooperation is so remote as as not to pose a moral problem for a Catholic to receive the, the vaccine. Thank you, Bishop. We'll move on to the next question. This one may have already been answered in previous ones, but perhaps you have something else to add. Having to choose between keeping a job and being vaccinated is coercion. Shouldn't Catholic schools provide an alternative for teachers such as rapid antigen testing? I'll, I will let Ruella go first. That seems to be as much a medical question as anything else. Yeah. So, look, I know uh, I'm, I'm sure there are places around the world that are doing this. I would say, however, that the way COVID works is that it is infectious before you have symptoms. Um, so you can still transmit the disease before you know that you have any symptoms. 
Um, and there is potentially a, a significant proportion of the population um, who have an asymptomatic infection. So rapid antigen testing is a possibility. However, it would need to be done at a frequency um, that would be sufficient to mitigate that risk. Um, but I, I couldn't give you any data about that. From, from an employment law perspective, it's going to depend very much on the degree to which it would be feasible for employers to be running a, a rapid antigen testing regime versus just requiring people to be vaccinated. I mean, that, so it will come down to accommodating that um, and, and just how onerous it is for an employer to, to try and accommodate that. That's, that, from a legal perspective, I think is where it will probably come down. Um, as Ruella says, uh, I note what Ruella says, sorry, and uh, I defer to her here, obviously, uh, but when, when, she, when Ruella said about um, there, is, there are people who are often infectious before they're symptomatic, that, that should, would suggest to, to my mind that rapid antigen testing will not be a sufficient accommodation because you're, you're asking the employer to offer a rapid antigen test that, as Ruella says, is actually not going to be effective at telling who's 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 actually got symptoms of it because they could already be infectious before the symptoms show so it's sort of it's sort of yeah so the, the, the horse is bolted for to use like well, well i imagine the rapid antigen testing would be done for asymptomatic people but i think people would have to be happy to do that every day that they turned up to work or every second day it's not something that could be done once a week or potentially even twice a week hmm. can, I, can i ask um really just for, uh, and and who would bear the cost who would bear the cost of that? Would that be the employer or? So I know that some, um, a lot of uh, outpatient clinics are running rapid antigen testing um, before they see people face to face. Um, and usually I believe it's the, um, the cost is borne by the patient. Right. Um, so I imagine if you're choosing not to get vaccinated, mm. then it's, um, I, I don't know that you would be able to argue that your employer should have to pay for those rapid antigen ki kits. The costs do vary. I've heard that some are as cheap as eight dollars, um, but you know, a, a cost is a cost, and if, if you're doing that for a lot of employees, then um, yeah, that's it could be a significant cost. Good. We'll move on to the final question in this umbrella of education. And the last question, perhaps, Bishop Umbers, it's more directed at yourself. What is the Australian Catholic uh, Bishop's response to mandatory vaccination of Catholic school staff? Um, again, I, I, um, I'm not sure that um, I would add to what Gray has already, already laid forth uh, in that regard, and it is a question of accommodation. Um, I'm, I don't represent the school, school sector. I mean, and, and that is a question of negotiation. But I, I, what I can say is that in, in working with government and, and trying to find a solution, and we live in a very imperfect world and we're scrambling uh, to, to come up with, you know, with, with, with the changing scenarios and new information. And so the, the need for solidarity and goodwill, uh, partnership is all the more important. Um, and, and I think what we're, what we're looking towards is, is what would a roadmap for exemptions look like? Um, but, but certainly, I, I think it, when it comes to any of these matters, it's, it's about trying to convince uh, with, with great arguments uh, why people um, should be looking to the, to the science of the time and, and, and making an informed decision along those lines. Yeah. And, if, and, if I, and if I can just fortify what the bishop said, I mean, this could be something that's actually taken out of the schools, the Catholic school system's hands, because for every person who's going to raise a conscience protection issue, not that, I mean, it's obviously very important. The, for instance, for, for teachers, say like the Independent Education Union will say, well, we represent a large number of teachers as well, some of which would fall into the category of people who, if they contracted COVID, could be very, very badly, uh, suffer very badly for it or die. And they also have to be protected as well. And so, the, I, I just think this is going to be a, a very long protracted process where odds are no one is going to be particularly happy with where we land on this. I, I, I know everyone wants to sort of assert their, their rights, but 
this is going to be something where everyone is going to have to wrestle with it. To use a really terrible analogy, it's like during when COVID broke, keeping churches open, allowing people to meet, is the fact that no one likes houses of worship shutting. No one likes it. But the fact that they were a place of gathering and therefore a place of gathering is a place of spread. And so there was this issue about religious freedom. Can you mitigate this and the like? And how can you accommodate this in some other way? And I think that's something we're going to have to do. And as the bishop said about goodwill and reasonableness, is that's something everyone's going to have to engage in. No, I don't think anyone is... I just don't think anyone is going to be absolutely happy about this. In the same way that I'm pretty sure, uh, Ruella will definitely correct me, going from 70% vaccinated to 80% vaccinated and opening things up, I'm sure there would be medical professionals who, who have great reservations about that. And they're probably not happy, but they're weighing up. We have to weigh up the freedoms versus the risks. And I, I think that's going to apply to a lot of things. So a lot of people who've written in to for this discussion asking for really black and white answers it's ex as the bishop said. It's extremely fluid, um, the, and we're just going to have to be reasonable and compromise and accept that we're not all going to be getting what we want, perhaps. And we're just going to have to make the best of it as we can. Um, sorry, that's that's just saying on chat. I appreciate it. Thank you, Gray. We'll move on to this last general question. It's just about, uh, and I, I believe we've answered quite a bit of it, but just to be a little bit more um, pointed in the answer. Um, this has come up as one of the stronger questions from what we've gathered. So what is the church's stance on not accepting people back to church who have not been vaccinated? Again, take into consideration that people who are vaccinated can still contract and transmit COVID. I have a lawnmower going next door, so I'm not sure whether you can hear that. Uh, no, it's, it's, no, I can't. <laughs> I'm not sure. Great. No, well, <laughs> you're fine, Bishop. <laughs> Okay. Look, I, I think that, um, again, there is just as many people who are also very concerned about uh, their own safety and, and, you know, from, from those who, who are not vaccinated. Um, we are come one, come all. We, everyone is, is going to be attended to pastorally. The issue will be in what, what will that look like? Um, and I think distinctions will need to be made. I also just want to say that I think there's a bit of a misconception out there that there's only a certain population that's vulnerable to COVID. Um, absolutely, there are risk factors for severe disease, um, you know, being over the... And the risk factors are, are, are very broad, like they're over being at the age of 65, being overweight or obese, being pregnant. So lots of very active, healthy relatively healthy people like my 72 year old dad who plays tennis multiple sets of tennis um you know who's fitter than i am um would be considered um more vulnerable uh based on the risk factors however we know that anyone can get anyone can get severe disease um people in their 20s people in their teens people in their 30s and 40s we've had deaths throughout this outbreak of young, healthy people who have died from COVID. Um, so you're not protected from a severe COVID infection just because you're young and healthy. You can still get severe illness. You can still get all the complications of COVID. You can get long COVID um, and you can die. So there's no protection simply by being young and having no medical issues. Great, thank you for your answers. So that, that concludes our more general questions to each of you on our panel. I'll now move on to our more directed questions and I'll start off with Dr. Ruella, then move on to Bishop Umbers before um, ending with Gray. At any point that you feel compelled to share or um, provide input uh, to the answer, you're more than welcome to also do so. So Dr. Ruella, I ask you the first question. Is there substantiated scientific evidence written that shows that COVID vaccines are safe, effective, and necessary? And do we know the long-term safety data that exists? Okay, so this is a huge question and I could probably talk about this for hours. So feel free to, to cut me short. I'll try and be as concise as I can. So I might have to break this down to, is it necessary, is it effective, and is it safe? So is it necessary? Um, 
so we we all know that COVID um, can cause a, a spectrum of disease. So most people will get a mild form of illness. And when I say mild, those symptoms might still be quite debilitating, but they're not severe enough to require hospitalization. However, like I said before, we know that um, while more severe disease is seen in certain pockets of the population, even young, healthy people can still get severe disease and can still die. And we don't know why, well, we know that COVID causes um, this severe inflammatory reaction in the body. And that's why we can't pick who will, we can't pick with 100% accuracy, or we can't predict with 100% accuracy, who will, um, who will have severe COVID. We also know that because of this inflammatory cascade, COVID causes quite significant complications. And while these are rare, these are still causing significant morbidity um, and deaths, even in young, healthy people. So these are things like um, clots, so um, clots in the heart causing heart attacks, clots in the brain causing strokes, clots elsewhere, like in the lungs or in the legs. Um, it's also causing um, uh, myocarditis, which is an inflammation of the heart muscle, um, leading to heart failure and funny heart rhythms that can kill. Um, and it's also causing neurological effects. So even things like Guillain-Barre syndrome, which Archbishop Fisher suffered from a couple of years ago. Um, we're also seeing um, this thing called long COVID, which is where people who have contracted the virus are getting quite debilitating symptoms for months um, to the point that it's affecting their ability to do their normal daily activities. Um, and some of the studies are showing that we're seeing this in up to 60% of patients who are hospitalised, um, even in patients who are otherwise young and healthy. So... We know, I guess, so we know enough about COVID to know why it's a dangerous disease. We also know that COVID is very infectious. It's much more infectious than, say, the flu. Um, and we know that the Delta variant is five to eight times more effective than, than the original variant um, of, of the SARS-CoV-2 virus. Um, and so when we're looking at the case numbers from a couple of weeks ago, we're looking at 1,500 cases. This is despite measures of hard lockdowns, um, despite um, hand hygiene, despite masks. And so we know that these measures are not sufficient to contain Delta outbreaks. Now, so we're looking at COVID from an individual point of view, but now we also need to look at it from a society point of view. Very few people, I think, are looking at the effect of COVID on the health system. Um, and the fact is, our health system is really struggling at the moment. And we know that we're only, we're not even seeing the worst of it yet. So as of today, I think there were 14,460 active cases in New South Wales. Of that, um, 1,234 people are hospitalised. Just to give you an idea of, um, of scale, Liverpool Hospital has 877 beds. Um, the vast majority of these 1,200 cases are in Western Sydney or Southwest Sydney. We are now moving patients who have COVID from these areas to other parts of New South Wales because our hospitals are struggling. Um, we know that we have 202 people in ICU we only have 592 ICU beds in New South Wales. Currently, we are using 30% of our ICU beds for COVID. We know that people with COVID stay in ICU for two to three weeks. Um, we know that they have, um, and we know that there's a lag between when people get symptoms um, and when people come to hospital. So there's usually a lag of about 11 days. So we are not seeing the effects of those 1,500 cases yet. So we know that for our hospital system, things are going to get worse and we expect things to peak in about October. We're already at 30% capacity with our ICUs. Now we do have the capacity to make more beds, to make more ICU beds, um, but this comes at a cost. Um, People aren't thinking about the burnout that healthcare workers are experiencing. They're not thinking about um, uh, staff needing to isolate because of exposures, um, which will happen as, as COVID be becomes more common um, 
uh, in society. And it will become more common because we, we're going to open up eventually. Everyone is going to be exposed to COVID. Um, so in terms of how necessary they are, um, I would say yes, absolutely, because we know that all our other measures against COVID are insufficient um, and that vaccines, we know that vaccines are the best method of preventing COVID infection. In terms of whether they're effective, it is, uh, the data speaks for itself. Um, there have been multiple very large studies on this looking at tens of thousands of people, but that's also, the effectiveness is also proven um, in, in, in the real world as well, looking at, um, you know, the, the comparison of, of deaths in um, UK this year compared to last year is, um, is, is, you know, there's a huge difference. Um, in terms of specific numbers, we know that two doses of, um, of Pfizer will give you about 83% protection against symptomatic illness and just over 90% protection against death, ICU admission um, and, and severe illness. Um, and AstraZeneca will give you about 60% um, protection against symptomatic illness, um, but will give you a similar rate to Pfizer, um, protection against hospitalization, ICU admission um, and mortality. We can see from the US data um, that unvaccinated people are four and a half times more likely to become infected. Um, they are 10 times more likely to be hospitalized and 11 times more likely to die. And this is reflected in the New South Wales data as well. Now, unfortunately, the data I'm about to give you is a bit out of date. It's, um, it's as of uh, September 4th, but it is New South Wales specific data. Only 2.7% of our cases um, are fully vaccinated. Um, only 4.5% of those hospitalized are fully vaccinated and only 0.8% of those in ICU um, were fully vaccinated as well. Um, and that is out of, at the time, there was 30% 30 30 of the population that was fully vaccinated. So the proportions you can see are clearly supportive that vaccines are effective against preventing COVID. Now, in terms of whether they're safe, um, everything in medicine is a risk, um, is a, everything in medicine has risks. And whenever we recommend something, we're looking at the risks versus the benefits and balancing them out. So I'll move on to Bishop Umbers. Um, Bishop Umbers, I have two questions for you. Perhaps I'll start with the, the shorter question, just because it might give some context to the, to the next one. What is the difference between moral responsibility and a moral obligation? Well, look, I, I, to answer simply, I think an obligation is where there's a very specific duty that, 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 that uh, has to be carried out. Moral responsibility sounds like a, a, a broader concern and there may be various options uh, that you could choose between in the fulfillment of that responsibility. Great, thank you, Bishop. So I move on to the second question. Pope Francis has endorsed vaccinations against COVID-19 and even gone ahead to get the jab himself. And many Catholics around the world have embraced his call, but a good number are against it for various reasons. How can the church communicate or amplify Pope Francis's message, especially among those who are anti-vax? Uh, well, I think we need to be focusing on the common good. As Catholics, we need to be talking very much about the common good. Um, <laughs> Only together is it possible to attain the common good. And, and, and for ourselves, we don't find fulfillment uh, just looking after ourselves. We need to be always looking to the fact that we live with others and for others. Uh, and that means all of us seeking other people's good as if it were our own. So this is, this is the gospel. Um, there is an individual responsibility but there's also a state responsibility. In fact, that's the, the, the common good is the purpose of why we have political authority. Uh, now, as they reconcile all the particular situations of different communities and of minorities in particular, that's a very delicate task. And it does mean being open to the supreme good, not just socioeconomic good. Um, and, and that's why where there's a conscientious objection, you know, for defensible reasons, well, we, we try to accommodate, we try to make space, uh, as we've alluded to before, but always keeping in mind that our autonomy is something that is relational, 
not something that is radical. Um, we do have all of us a responsibility not to put others at risk of serious illness. And, um, you know, that responsibility, okay, it's lived out in different ways. But, but most especially in, in getting vaccinated on the advice of your doctor. Great, thank you, Bishop. I mean, I mean, one one way um, one way I, I I find I find it helpful to people is to explain when you're getting vaccinated, you're not just protecting yourself; you're protecting other people. You're protecting people who can't get vaccinated themselves. I mean, you're actually protecting. And um, I was on the ABC um, a few months ago with Mary Lu Mary Louise McClaws from I think she's from UNSW. She's the expert in epidemiology, and she was very clear about the fact we need to get to say 75%, 80% to have herd immunity. Now, um, that can only be achieved if people are actually getting vaccinated. I mean, that, as uh, Ruella definitely will correct me there, but I mean, that that's my understanding is we can only get herd immunity with people getting vaccinated. And so it's actually a very small thing that you're being asked to do, I think. It's a very small thing that you're being asked to do. Uh, people in generations past uh, had, you know, our ancestors had two world wars or more. Um, and, then, and between them, they had a depression. Uh, and after one of the first world wars, after the first world war, they had the Spanish flu. I mean, they, they, they really went through it all. And that's a lot of being in a sort of political community, a sort of national family, is that you all have to be able to do that. You all, you all have some duties to them. Uh, one thing I find very interesting with Catholics particularly, and I think people are slightly shocked when I tell them this, is that during both world wars, Catholics had incredibly low rates, I think the lowest rate, um, of conscientious objections. Uh, to the war. And the idea is that's because in Catholicism, there's no great tradition of pacifism or quietism. You have duties to the common good. Um, those duties include in wartime that you you do your bit to defend the society. It may be that you're at the front line. It may be that you're in some other job, but you've all got some duty to the common good because not everything in life is about you. And I think that's actually quite a good part of the Catholic tradition is that we talk in a more communitarian language about duties owed to us not rights asserted by me. I think that's something that's actually very good about the Catholic tradition. I think that's why we as a faith, you know, founded schools and hospitals. We sort of take in everyone. And I think that's a great part of our tradition. I, I personally think, quite apart from the moral side, culturally it would be terrible for Catholics to take in this kind of hyper-individualistic idea that everything is about me and about my rights and the like. I mean, you know, it's, it's why the, the, the parable of the Good Samaritan is so important is that is that the Good Samaritan wasn't thinking of himself. Like the, the Good Samaritan was thinking about there is someone. Actually, it's in the common good, perhaps also that we don't have people beaten up on the road between Jericho and Jerusalem. And um, and 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 so therefore, and the, other, the other thing that I'd never thought of before, but I, I looked at it recently, um, was something Pope Benedict said about the, the innkeeper. I mean, everyone focuses on the Good Samaritan looking after the injured man, but it's the innkeeper who's just doing his job of keeping in and looking after people and being an honest innkeeper who would take money and look after people. He's the person who enables the healing to take place just by doing his small duty. And in some respects, all of us are kind of like the innkeeper doing our small duty of getting vaccinated that will then protect people against the through herd immunity, against... The real risks of this of this pandemic claiming more lives. I, I I honestly don't think it's anything more complicated than that. And I think we overcomplicate things. And I think giving license to people to sort of assert, well, basically a my body, my choice argument. I think it's absolutely alien to the sort of Catholic tradition. I think it's it, it's madness to grant it um, any more um, any more standing in Catholic thinking um, than it could possibly have based on an individual's deeply held honest, good faith, conscientious objection. I think other than that, it should be dismissed because I think it's actually a very dangerous way of thinking it. Um, we're not a rights-based faith. We're very much a duties and obligations-based faith because Catholicism is actually a tough faith. And if you've gone through things, um, uh, I lost both my parents. So I was with them, um, both my parents, through their struggles and to the end. Um, you know, Catholics, you know, we oppose euthanasia. We think there's dignity in suffering. We think there's dignity in doing things. You know, you act, you don't have a right to avoid suffering. You don't have a right to to an easy way out of life, if I can put it that way. You know, we see dignity in suffering. We also see dignity in suffering together and in helping each other and pulling together as a community. And I think I, I'm quite concerned. Um, I'm quite concerned how much as Catholics we grant 
a premise or granted validity to a premise that actually is entirely alien to the way we've always thought as Catholics. Um, the bishop might 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 have 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 his own uh, his own uh, Episcopal uh, view there, but uh, but very much that's my view because I think it's quite concerning in the social media age where everyone is their own. Can I say not to with respect to Ruel and not just their own doctor, but I can say their own lawyer and everything because the power of Google anoints you so. No doubt the bishop will say your own theologian as well, but just. We have so many just people just asserting all sorts of nonsense, and it actually has no place in our way, traditionally in our way of thinking, which is not like that, uh, and which often accepts expertise in certain areas, you know, and 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 builds on it. It's why Catholicism has such a great tradition of of learning and teaching, you know, and thinking is for that reason. Is we accept a hierarchy, we accept a humility before the facts, and, well, and I, I would I would add to that, Craig, that it's actually good for Catholics to accept the magisterium. Of the magisterium, mm. yes. And I mean, yes. as as Catholics, we believe that we have the fullness of the truth, and God's given us intellect, and we have a responsibility to use it. We have a responsibility to not, you know, to seek the truth um, and not believe everything that you see um, if it doesn't come from a reliable source. You know, mm. you, you have a responsibility to to make sure that what you are practicing is true. Mm. Hmm. Faith and reason. Hmm. Yeah, faith and reason. That's an important part of our how we do things. And I've just, as I said, sorry, sorry to almost rant about this, but it's just something I've really noticed in the last couple of months is the degree to which even quite traditionally minded Catholics will on occasions assert various rights. And it's like that's that's not that's generally not part of our tradition. It's not we're not a hyper individualist. We're not against individuals. We're not for collectives, but we're not a hyper individualist faith. We never have been. Like, it's just not how we do things. And um, as I said to you, I, I find it all quite concerning because one of the things about vaccination, as the Pope said in his message, getting vaccinated is not just about you. It's a sort of an act of solidarity. And because herd immunity is really a form of of solidarity, in a, in a sense, for the community, where we're actually bonding together to try and make sure that the weaker members of the herd are protected. And there are some people who cannot get vaccinated. And so it becomes all the more important I think is a moral matter. Um, I leave to well at the medical side, but it's a moral matter that you actually step up and you actually protect that weaker member of the herd. And then it becomes even less about you because not everything in life is about you. And it's like, there's a sort of zeitgeist around in the pandemic that every, you saw it like with people protesting and so on. No one likes being locked down. I, I, I have, no one enjoys it. No one enjoys being stuck at home, but we're actually stuck at home to stop a virus spreading that will kill people in certain demographics. Even as we're finding the Delta strain, people in nominally healthy states and younger people, it will kill. And so that's why we're doing it. And so uh, when you go out and protest in assertion of what you think are your rights, you're actually risking the lives of people who are vulnerable. And that's something that's alien to our tradition. We don't do that. Um, and I think that needs to be spelled out very, very clearly because there seems to be like a, a sort of almost a desire to be kind of nice and understanding of people who actually need sort of, I think, the full force of the magisterium magisteriums magisteria i think because i because because i just think there's so much foolishness on this and i think as the pope said it's it's quite a clear thing i mean we've got vaccines thank god we have vaccines not just for covid but for a variety of other things that that killed our ancestors or gave our ancestors very very short and and painful and brutish lives and i think we should do anything be thankful for the fact that we have intellects we have researchers we have scientists we have doctors like ruella and we have people who know things about about how we get sick and how we cure not just can be cured of that but how we can prevent a disease from spreading and i just have no i think it's almost uh, the antithesis of what it's about to be catholic to sort of take on this hyper individualistic and also anti-knowledge sort of perspective I think perhaps what we're avoiding, though, is the the reason why many Catholics are opposed to this vaccination, um, and uh, that would be because I, I hope that would be because of the the fetal cell line use, rather than you know, rather than any other reason about mandates or um, you know any other concerns. Mm. But um, fetal cell lines, unfortunately, are now used um, in in a lot of modern medicine um they used 
to, to study a lot of medications and a lot of the medications that we've used for, to, to combat COVID. So things like ivermectin, things like monoclonal antibodies, things like um, hydroxychloroquine, um, these have all used fetal cell lines in, in their testing. Um, so if you, uh, so where my logic takes me to is that if I'm going to oppose a vaccine because it's used a fetal cell line in its development, do I therefore reject all of these other medications? Um, and in fact, a lot of you know cancer therapies, a lot of other modern medicine, um, because of a similar cooperation. Looking into this, there is you know the sad reality is a lot of modern medicine does use fetal cell lines. Um, the way that it comes about is um, the fetal cell. So unfortunately there was an abortion in the Netherlands in 1973. Um, and that, that, that fetus, that baby was um, uh, a cell was taken from her kidney. Um, and that cell has been adapted so that it, um, so that it uh, divides <laughs> ad infinitum. Um, so there's no limit to how often it divides. And that, um, that cell um, is grown in a lab now. Um, in at, at infinitum. So I can understand that there is a concern about the use of fetal cells. Um, however, the the abortions aren't ongoing. Um, and I think when you weigh up, you know, Bishop Umbers, you can probably comment on this much more. But um, you know, when you when you weigh up the the benefits versus, um, you know. It, like it's it's all it's all a grey area essentially. Like you can't um you can't say that because this is evil, um, I will therefore not partake in it at all. Because then you would essentially be washing your hands of all modern medicine. Mm. Bishop, did you have something to comment off that? I know you did mention it. Well, at the Thomas beginning. Thomas Aquinas actually does speak to to that uh, in in the Summa, um, where wrong has been done, but then down the track. You know, I mean, even God is able to draw good out of out of evil. Um, so, I think there is a distinction between formal and material cooperation. Um, the the world that we live in, like I might say, I object to Qantas for any number of reasons. Okay, well, who else am I going to fly with? You know, is that other company any better? Um, I may say that I'm not going to watch Netflix again. You know, I may choose to do so. You know, but does that make the other streaming services any better? Um, and and it, it really goes on and on. And there will be there will be issues in which we wish to take a stance and we, we want to say something. That's fine. Um, but to live in, in in this world, you know, we cooperate with all manner of things all the time, even paying taxes. Yeah. So it, it is a question of, of looking at at, at uh, from the perspective of the of the of the moral agent, um, and, and to see. Well, look, you know, what's my intention here? Uh, is there a scandal? Am I promoting? Am I supporting? Would this go ahead if, you know, with, with, with or without my, my cooperation? Um, all of that is, it comes into play. And, and I think in this particular case, um, whilst, you know, we can, we can certainly ask and, and say, please give us, you know, a, a more ethical line uh, and promote an ethical line and, um, and we, we do all of that, but having done that, having done that, um, you have to say, but this is what's available. Bishop, can I just ask, if I, for example, bought a, a smartphone that was made in China and that um, product contributed to taxes to the Chinese government, which, as we know, has various forced abortion policies and, um, and suppresses our church, isn't that more of a cooperation with evil than say getting a vaccine that has a relationship to an abortion that happened in, in the 1970s? Yeah, I, I, it's difficult to draw those sorts of comparisons. It's better to look at the at each moral case as, as it arises, I think. And, and so you'd have to look at what are the facts of the case. I mean, certainly in the archdiocese, we're very big on anti-slavery and, and the supply chain um, that, that leads to that. Now, it's, so it may be but when you go into the details of it, you might say, you know what, no, you know, I'll, I'm going to be, I will actually look to, a, to another kind of phone company, depending, depending, you know, but do I order things from Amazon? 
Do I buy Nike? Do I, you know, and, and look, it's going to be up to, to the kind of investigation that you put into that. But ultimately, there's you know, crossing the road, driving in a car, all of these things. There's, there, you know, there, there's a, a point at which you, you have to employ practical uh, wisdom and, and just say, well, you know, we, we live in an imperfect world. I mean, the, the, what, what we really should be doing many times is, is drowning evil in an abundance of good and, and looking to see how are we promoting the good? How are we getting together with others to, to ensure that we are creating a, a just society and a civilization of love? Mm. Thank you, Bishop. And thank you, Ruella and Gray, for uh, adding to those questions. I'd just like to now move on to Gray. Just a couple of questions for you that we've got. The first one is, does the law allow for conscientious objection of vaccines? Um. As I said, as I said before, I mean it's 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 imported into every employment contract that employees do what is lawful and reasonably directed of them. So, so really, um, if you're sort of looking at it the wrong way. Is that is that is that in our system, employer advertises for job, employees applies, um, they get together and and agree a contractual framework. Um, some of which will be mandated by statute, some of which will be spelled out in the contract itself, and, and and a variety of other sort of agreements that form part of that, and that then becomes the basis of of work as an employee. Um, conscientious objection really does not come into it. What would come into it is whether an employee is being asked something of them which is either unlawful or which is lawful but unreasonable. And so that really would be the issue. So there is no... But conscious objection really will not come into say ninety nine point nine percent of of employee employer arrangements. Um, in relation to in relation to uh, in this case getting vaccinated, that will come about most probably as a function of the work they do. The requirement will come out as a function of you required to be vaccinated because of the work you do, the nature of the work you do, the facts and circumstances of the work you do, the facts and circumstances in the industry that you're in. And it is from that requirement based on those concrete circumstances that the question of whether you have a conscientious objection, which is reasonable. It may be that you have a conscientious objection, but it may be unreasonable to expect a employer to accommodate that. Um, and I think it's very, very important, given that I've seen people bandy about, I um, mean, arguments about uh, you know, Nuremberg principles. I, I find it interesting because people often in their, their haste confused Nuremberg principles and Nuremberg laws um, and so on. I think generally speaking, people should just avoid all discussion of anything involving Nuremberg. Um, but people will sort of go hype, go sort of off the deep end on these things when in fact, most employment relationships are pretty mundane and they do revolve around whether you're being asked to do something that is lawful and whether you're being asked to do something that's reasonable. And most of the time it's on the expectation is the employee or employer will work something out reasonably as as mature people and then if that fails obviously you have processes through uh unions and through fair work and the like to work things out um if people think though that there is a conscientious objection to your employer being uh requiring you to be vaccinated well odds are that requirement will fall fall out of or descend from a government requirement that people be vaccinated. I think, I think it's very unlikely that employers are going to move in advance of what government mandates or government requires. So I, 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 I think it's going to be very unlikely. So really the issue will be, do you have a conscientious objection to that, it, that will be sustained, that will be upheld to something your employer is requiring you to do because of a government direction or order or, dare I say it, mandate, as much as I hate the word mandate. Um, I think that's going to be very, very difficult in some industries because it will simply be unreasonable or very, very difficult for an employer following that government mandate to accommodate that employee if truly they do object. I mean, uh, it's going to be very, very difficult, for instance, for people who work, say, in transportation. You know, if you're a pilot, flight attendant, you work in an airport, um, you even work around baggage. I mean, I mean, this current Delta outbreak is from an unvaccinated limousine driver. Um, so it, it's going to be very, very difficult, particularly, can I say, 
in the case of uh, New South Wales, given that a lot of our problems come from that unvaccinated limousine driver, it's going to be very, very hard for people to say, me, getting vac me refusing to be vaccinated has no downstream effects when we've basically in this situation because of an unvaccinated limo driver who did not get vaccinated. And it'd be very easy for an authority to point to a concrete example of, well, this is what happens when there was no vaccination. This is where it proceeds from. Now, as a matter of causation, that might not be true, but that's a very simple thing for someone to be able to understand, particularly at, at fair work or the like. So um, I would be very ca cautious of advising people to, to try and run a conscious objection argument. They'd be much better off running an argument of it's unreasonable to require me to be vaccinated because of this reason or that, and it is a good faith, deeply held reason. Even then, I'm just not sure when the, when the full requirements are rolled out over the next few months, because uh, this morning, I mean, I'll just, I'll just finish this. I think it'd be very straight, very unwise to base your refusal on some um, uh, imprecise conscientious objection when odds are there will be a plethora of government uh, directions and orders requiring mandatory vaccinations in certain areas. And just this morning, uh, Gladys Berejiklian, the Premier of New South Wales, was talking about uh, what will be required, for instance, in education with teachers. Um, so obviously, having done healthcare workers, airports and so on, we're moving along to education. Odds are there will be a whole range of, of industries uh, that will be affected by these requirements. And so... Um, uh, obviously, Ruella's talked about the situation for healthcare workers. That seems to be an obvious one. Aged care, that would be an obvious one. Um, people who work in airports and transportation, that would be an obvious one. And then we'll come to the situation, as I said before, of responsibilities owed by uh, employers and by institutions and, and government agencies to people who are vaccinated, who are vulnerable, and and whether they can be balanced with, with whatever is claimed by the unvaccinated. For, so, for example, I mean... Do you have a right as an unvaccinated person who may be susceptible to being a spreader of COVID? Do you have a right to travel um, like anyone else on buses, trains, planes, and the like? I think the tr I think the real issue is going to be less about employment than I think they're going to be issues about um, freedom of movement issues and free and, and rights of patronage. I think that's going to be a bigger issue. Now, as Catholics, that's going to come across in things like going to mass. Who gets to go to mass? Do do you have different mass arrangements for the vaccinated and the unvaccinated? That's going to create a whole host of problems. Anyone claiming they know how that's going to work out at this stage is is mad um, because I think, can see that being in the courts for the next year and being very, very difficult. And I can think of at least three quite good lawyers who would give you different opinions on this. So um, as I said, I think the, the simplest way to advise people is if you genuinely have a good faith belief in why you should not be vaccinated and it's an informed good faith belief then the, then you're really going to have the onus put on you to explain your objection and your refusal to get vaccinated because it's just going to be very very hard for that to be sustained uh i hope that's was that clear was that yes very helpful thank you very much gray and i think in your response there you've also answered the second question so i, I won't be <laughs> I won't be asking you that one. Well, well I, I, just, I just wanted to say this, is that sure. a, lot, a lot of this on the legal side is very, very fluid because we haven't had a pandemic on this scale since, mm -hmm. since, the, mm -hmm. since the end of the First World War. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, it's like I, I had to point this out to people is that even before the First World War, we had quarantines of various areas. Quarantine has a long history in Australia. And, and generally speaking, um, in Australia particularly, in the common law world, world generally, but in Australia in particular, courts defer to the government, particularly the executive government, at a time of crisis. So, um, you know, be it war, uh, natural disasters, terrorism, or in this case, the pandemic, courts generally trust that governments are there to protect the, to protect the community. They are there very much as the protector of the community, and courts are not going to referee decisions as a whole on, a, as a whole, on what the, the government does to protect the community. Uh, they're just not. And I, I, I realise a lot of people have this almost imported American idea of what courts do that is just not true for our jurisdiction, where our courts have a long tradition of deferring to the executive government in a time of crisis. Um, anyone who, is, who has the either the blessing or the misfortune to be one of my students hears me say this all the time, is that our courts have a long tradition of deferring to the executive government in a time of crisis. And executive governments, particularly, say, in a pandemic where it's informed by doctors, 
someone like Weller and so on, like who 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 studies this, the experts we have, a government that is be, that is relying on that advice in good faith to implement measures. I just do not see a court which is made up basically of lawyers who are, for the most part, curious lay people. Uh, there are there are. Yeah, there are judges you will meet who have a copy of Grey's Anatomy somewhere on the shelf because they once thought they could be a doctor. Uh, but on the whole, they're curious lay people. They're not going to get into the minutia of 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 refereeing official medical advice because it's not they don't know enough and they're not going to waste the time or create um, hesitancy in the body politic that the government does not have the power to do things. And it's just very important to get that across to people is that there seems to be a lot of view that you can assert certain rights and they will be upheld. The facts are, it's a fluid situation. It's a, dare I say, a very grey area. And and they're going to have to accept the fact that uh, governments will be governing for the good of the, of, of, of the body politic as a whole and that and that not everyone is going to be happy out of this. And so I, I sound like a bit of a broken record, but it's just, I think where we come down on this for the next year is there probably will be some arrangements for the unvaccinated but they will be nowhere near as generous as I think people who are unvaccinated, militantly unvaccinated, want them to be. And at the same time, people who want no exemptions at all, they will probably be disappointed because at the end of the day, again, we all have to live together. As I, to use the analogy before, there will be doctors who at 70% do not want a massive reopening of the state of New South Wales anyway, but the government will have a staggered reopening because they have to listen to what the doctors say, but they also have to accept they govern a community and that there will be a substantial number of people who are double vaxxed and they will want to get on with their lives. And so there'll be a balancing test for everyone. Thank you. Just on a pastoral note, can I say that um, as priests, we've often been uh, required to have the flu shot to be able to attend to people on aged residences or at the hospital. Um, also, alongside that, we are very happy to uh, bring the sacraments to anybody. Um, we're actually allowed to make pastoral visits so as, as an excuse for a reasonable excuse for leaving home um, and uh, something which, which is what we've been doing, whether it be bringing um, the, the sacrament of the, of the sick uh, to, to people who are, uh, who are seriously ill um, through to home masses. Um, that's something that, that many of the, the clergy, myself included, have been involved in. And um, in my own case, I've been able to do that uh, uh, effectively because I am um, vaccinated. Appreciate that insight. Thank you, Bishop, and thank you, Gray. We're now nearing the end of our program tonight, and I'd just like to direct the questions back to Ruella, a couple more just to wrap us up, and then I will invite your final remarks for us to close off. It's already been a very robust conversation, so I really do appreciate your time again. Ruella, we just uh, left off at you explaining that the vaccines uh, we were explaining whether or not they are safe. Would you like to continue just on that point? And hopefully we'll have some time, perhaps in another, we have another 10 minutes to answer the last two. Sure. Okay. So in terms of safety, um, everything in medicine comes with risks like in life. Um, and whether or not we, um, whether or not we recommend something as medical professionals is a balance based on the risks versus the benefits. So I guess I've already talked about the benefits, um, but the vaccines do come with risks, and those are those side effects are well documented. I will say, however, that those side effects are all seen um, as a result of COVID infections as well, and they're also seen at a higher rate in COVID infections. So I know that there's been a lot of reports about, um, you know, TTS, for example, or, or myocarditis, um, but I think what's missing is that balanced approach that if you get COVID, you're actually much more likely um, to have these effects. So just to, to, to give you some numbers, so say, for example, um, uh, TTS, which is associated with the AstraZeneca vaccine, which is um, an immune reaction that affects your platelet, so it causes um, clots as well as low platelets. Um, it's, a, it's a very rare side effect, um, and we have the advantage of being later on in the rollout, so we know... Um, we know how to detect it and how to treat it. Um, so our mortality rates from that are very low. So your chances of dying from that are less than one in a million. Um, and your chance of getting it as well is also very low. Um, so out of the 10.2 million AstraZeneca doses that have been given in Australia, there are 132 cases. Um, compare that to... Um, 
to how likely you are to get, say, a clot in your brain from COVID, you're actually 100 times more likely. Um, uh, sorry, you're 10 times more likely to get a clot in your brain. But to put that into perspective um, in terms of general life risks, your risk of dying in a car accident is about one in 10,000. So you're actually 100 times more likely to die in a car accident than you are to get TTS from the AstraZeneca vaccine. It's a similar thing when we look at the Pfizer vaccine. So the, the biggest risk um, or the most, uh, the most dangerous risk um, is, um, is myocarditis, which is in, an inflammation of the, the heart. Um, and again, also very rare. So of the 10.7 million um, Pfizer doses, there have been 370 cases. Um, and compared to people who get COVID infections, um, it's much more, um, you're six times more likely um, to get myocarditis from a COVID infection. And that myocarditis is going to be more severe um, and it has been associated with fatalities. Unlike with the vaccination, um, we've, we've had these number of cases um, and, and no fatalities. They're usually, um, it's, a, it's usually a very self-limiting disease. Most people don't even require hospitalization for it. So when we're looking at the risks, we need to balance those risks um, in terms of basic life, life activities as well. So knowing that you're 100 times more likely to die in a car accident than you are to get TTS, your risk of getting myocarditis from Pfizer if you're a young male is roughly the same as dying from a car accident. And yet no one's advocating that we don't drive because of the significant risks of having a car accident. Um, so I think we need to, to, to balance these risks when, when we're talking about the safety. So we also have very robust um, vaccine surveillance systems um, across the entire developed world, but in Australia as well. Um, and they look at the baseline levels of what we would, ex what, uh, sorry, so just to clarify, I'll just repeat that bit. Um, so we have very robust um, surveillance mechanisms when it comes to vaccines um, across the developed world, but particularly in Australia. And what they do is they look at the baseline levels of each illness in Australia. Um, and whenever we see more of something that we would expect, it prompts an investigation. It sends a signal um, and that is investigated by a body. And that's how we were able to pick up that there were these issues with the vaccines in the first place, these rare but significant issues. Um, and in, in the past, that's picked up um, issues that have been addressed. I think we've given over 5 billion vaccines now across the world. I think I'm, con I'm confident that we have picked up all the significant adverse effects that we are going to pick up. The majority of adverse effects that are related to vaccines happen within the first few months. Um, and every vaccine generally, um, when it's being tested in phase three studies, um, the follow-up period is generally only somewhere between two and six months. And that has been the case for these vaccines as well. I think it's very difficult, um, you know, vaccines, they're injected into your body, they're at less than 10 second event. Um, they're cleared from the body within 72 hours. Um, it's very biologically implausible that such a short event um, that doesn't get incorporated into your body um, is going to have um, long-term effects. Um, and that's the case for, for all vaccines that we know of. Thanks, Dr. Ruella. Really appreciate that overview that you've provided. Our final question for you is about booster shots. So the question is how many vaccine boosters will people need to take considering now that Israel are looking at their fourth booster? So I think that the data doesn't um, give us an answer on this. Um, and this will be uh, a question that I can't really answer um, based, on the based on the data. Um, you know, I don't have a crystal ball. But what I can tell you um, is that we expect immunity, it's, it doesn't surprise me that immunity 
um, in some vaccinations has waned. We see that with other vaccines, for example, um, measles or tetanus, which is why we get boosters, um, and that's not considered such a big deal. We also know that with the family of coronaviruses in general, immunity, even if you've had a natural infection, it tends to wane anyways. So I'm not surprised that we're seeing um, that we're that we're seeing that in this case. However, what the studies are showing is that even though the um, even though the effectiveness against symptomatic infection um, in in the case of Pfizer, at least not so much with AstraZeneca, is declining at a slow rate. Um, the protection against severe illness, the protection against ICU admission and the protection against mortality is still very much there. Um, so what we're seeing in Israel, there was actually a study in Israel that showed that despite the waning immunity, the rate of serious illness in vaccinated, sorry, in unvaccinated people um, over the age of 60, they were nine times more likely to, um, to have severe illness um, compared to uh, people who were um, vaccinated. Um, so despite this waning immunity when it comes to symptomatic infections, it's still protecting um, the community and still protecting the health system, which was one of the reasons that, that people um, should be getting vaccinated in, in this time of COVID. What I will also say, I didn't address it before, but um, COVID, when, when it fills up our hospitals to this degree, um, it has flow on effects that people don't quite appreciate. So when our hospitals are so full of COVID, our hospitals are not designed to look after one illness. Um, people who would normally be in hospitals, and our hospitals were chockers before this pandemic hit, um, people who have cancer, who need elective surgery, people who need hip replacements, these things are not getting addressed to the same degree that they normally would. Um, and so I'm concerned that in the next few months, in the next few years, we're going to see excess morbidity and mortality because these issues um, haven't been addressed in a timely manner. Um, and so that's something that we also need to take into account as well. Great. Thank you for that final point that you just made. I think it's something that, like you said, many don't appreciate. So we've come to the end of our program and I just want to say thank you very much for each of your comments and for highlighting a number of different factors that we should consider in this time of, uh, in this climate that we're in. Before we head off, I invite you to each make some final remarks. Perhaps there is something that you'd like for us to take away after listening to the comments that have been made. So I invite Bishop Umbez if you'd like to go first. Oh, keep praying for an end to the pandemic. No. Choose your favourite saint. There's a few out there uh, who, who we've uh, traditionally prayed to in, in, in these times. Um, and there are mass texts available, obviously, uh, pleading with God uh, for, for an end to the scourge. Bishop, do you have a favourite saint that you're praying to at the moment? Well, actually, um, I'm in the parish of St. Paul of the Cross. So, uh, yeah, I, I guess I've have <laughs> a very special devotion to the uh, patron saint of the parish. Beautiful. Thank you. Gray, any final remarks for us tonight? Uh, yes. Uh, just just what I um, said before, just if everyone could just um, uh, be, be uh, as calm as they can be and be as modest as they can reasonably be in asserting various rights. Um, if you have a genuine employment dispute about vaccinations with your employer, um, speak to a good employment lawyer, which you can find through the Law Society of New South Wales and, uh, and document everything and keep calm and uh, try and work things out through uh, the normal mechanisms that you would work things out through at work and realise it's really on you and your employer to come to a reasonable accommodation um, in all the facts and circumstances of your employment. Uh, please do not uh, inflame things or assert rights that do not exist. Uh, you do not only do yourself a grave disservice, but you also, I think, uh, do damage to Catholics generally um, um, in terms of trying to almost uh, go off the deep end about things. It doesn't help anyone, and it certainly doesn't advance your case. On a more general rule, if people could perhaps think more about the fact that um, we we uh, exist as uh, as Catholics and as and as and as people and as citizens of a of a political community, we all have duties of solidarity to each other. 
and that unless you have a very, very good excuse, you should be getting vaccinated. Um, it's an obligation that we all have to the common good. It's an obligation born of solidarity and it's an obligation that is very, very easy to fulfil. No one is asking you to land at Gallipoli. No one's asking you to storm any beaches. All that's asked is for you to book an appointment, go and see your doctor, get some advice and, uh, and get vaccinated. It's pretty simple, very easy. I've done it. I strongly recommend it to everyone. Thank you, Gray. Appreciate your comments. Dr. Rovella, any final remarks from yourself? Um, I think for me, you know, what Gray was saying about herd immunity is absolutely true. It's the ultimate group project. It's the ultimate team sport. If we don't all do our bit, then we all suffer. It only works if a certain number of us decide to get vaccinated and protect the community as a whole. And when you are making your decision, you need to think about not just the individual benefits, but also the societal benefits as well. Um, and I think the evidence clearly shows there is a lot of misinformation out there, but if you go talk to your doctor about it, I think you would find that there's a lot of um, a, a large body of evidence that, that shows that the benefits of getting vaccinated greatly outweigh the risks. Um, but if you are concerned, go talk to someone who actually knows what they're talking about. Don't go down rabbit holes trying to find your information on Facebook. Um, we have a moral obligation to seek the truth um, and, uh, you know, and we have an intellect and we need to exercise that. Great. Well, thank you all once again for joining us tonight. For everyone who is listening and all those who are watching, we thank you for spending some time. We hope that all this information is good for you and, and it really helps you to be affirmed of the decisions that you're making. I echo Bishop Umbers as he says that we should continue to remain prayerful. Um, may we be reminded that God is very much present with us in our suffering and that he seeks our good. So for all of you, thank you again. And to our panelists, thank you very much for your time. Have a good night, everyone. Thank you. Thank you.